a very good morning to all of you and uh, congratulations to uh, dr praveen i'd like to meet uh, professor piyala midyala from japan and i'm really pleased to hear the uh, wonderful activities of uh, stem science technology engineering and mathematics i'll be very pleased to associate with all your activities and very best wishes for the international conference on carbon materials and nanotechnology and i am very pleased to be associated with this conference thank you thank the you the title of my the title of my presentation is interfacial modification in nanocomposites to tailor functionalities what i'm going to show you is how we can modify the surface interfaces to meet the required properties and also to 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 manufacture high performance materials we can all see the the overview of my uh, my the aerial view of my university is a very green campus and probably at the end of my talk i will show you a couple of slides of our uh, our region if you look at the presentation of my uh, of my uh, talk today there is a small introduction then i will take you to some of my work on clay polymer nanocomposites we have been very active uh, putting clay into different types of polymers and to make value added material we have been cooperating with uh, tire companies in india to manufacture automotive inner liners in the tubes i will show you a couple of slides then i will take you some of our activity on cnt polymer nanocomposite putting carbon nanotube into polymers and making value added materials i will show you some of our activity with the jamus papers united states they are the biggest cable company in the us so we made some hybrid nanocomposites for the company then i will take you to uh, super tough materials nano structure super tough materials for department of space in india uh, we'll show you a couple of our um, activities on sensors thin films and bio nanocomposites for uh, tissue engineering then find if you can loading the marks if you look at our group we are extremely active in uh, nano tubes a graphene nanochar different types of metal oxides silicon in natural clays biological nano materials like nano cellulose nano chitin nano starch so we are active on a variety of nano structured materials and you might ask why polymer people like me are really interested in nano materials because when you put nano structured materials in the polymers you can get pretty high strength mechanical reinforcement without sacrificing ductility that's a very important point you can have excellent optical properties excellent electronic properties we made conductive elastic bands excellent heat stability resistance to flame resistance to gas transport resistance to abrasion so you can impart exciting properties to the polymers by adding nano structured materials if you look at the nano structured materials you can classify them based on aspect ratio of course spherical particles your aspect ratio 1 aspect ratio between 10 and 20 aspect ratio from 100 to 100 to 200 so we are able to make such beautiful materials if you look at nano cellulose they have high aspect ratio and when you put this material to the polymers one has to look at different phenomena one is a viscosity increase when you put nano structured materials in the polymers the viscosity build up is high and many companies are not very happy to see that if you look at the viscosity build up the high aspect ratio fillers are actually bad because they give rise to high viscosity build up then you have to put lots of energy to process the material look at the mechanical reinforcement the strength that you get the modulus that you get the high aspect ratio fillers are always good if you put clay if you put nano cellulose you put carbon nanotube you put graphene you get really good good mechanical strength similarly if you look at barrier properties again you will find that high aspect ratio fillers like clay is an exciting material to get barrier properties many of our activities with car companies are with clay or graphene giving very good resistance to transport dispersion in terms of dispersion there's a big issue if you try to put 
high aspect of shikulates, like carbon nanotube or graphene, very difficult to be dispersed. In that respect, I would say a spherical or, or low aspect of shikulates are easy to disperse. So one has to see all these aspects when you design the polymer nanocomposites, viscosity, mechanical reinforcement, barrier, dispersion issues. Now let me take you the story of clay. Clay is a very interesting material. We have been very active in clay over the last few years. The beauty of clay is if you look at MMG, very high stiffness, 170 gigapascals. That is the, the modulus the, the stiffness of clay. That's why we are really interested. Polymer people like me are interested in clay because clay can give rise to very high mechanical reinforcements. Typically, the modulus of a polymer is maybe two, three gigapascals. Look at clay stiffness, one seventy gigapascal. And what is clay? You can see two tetrahedral, silica tetrahedral, fused to a magnesium or medium octahedral. And the gallery spacing is very close to one nanometer. So the clay layers are always held together by strong electrostatic attraction. If you really want to mix polymer and clay together, we have to destroy these electrostatic interactions. That is why chemistry plays a very important role. If you cannot destroy this electrostatic interaction between the platelets, you cannot disperse clay in polymer. See, look at this slide. This is, a, this is without no chemistry. If you just put clay and polymer together, you end up in a conventional composite. Their properties decrease. On the other hand, if you do a good chemistry, you can achieve this sort of dispersion. All the clay particles have been separated well dispersed. We call it as exfoliated nanocomposite. Look at something intermediate where some sort of intercalation has taken place. The macromolecular chains could diffuse into the intercalaries. And how do you follow this? You can follow by X-ray scattering. You can go follow by high resolution electron microscopy. You can also use, um, uh, to some extent, atomic force microscopy. So my group is extremely active uh, uh, in building a strong interface between polymer and mineral. Because polymers like polypropylene, polyethylene, natural rubber, SBR, they are hydrophobic. Clay is hydrophobic. There's always a mismatch. So my group is active uh, in building a strong interface between polymer and clay. Polymer is most of polymers we deal with hydrophobic. So we do different types of strategies. We functionalize the polymer structure. We functionalize the uh, mineral surface. We make use of uh, block and drop copolymers. We do in situ reactive extrusion process. We have a variety of strategies. We adopt surfactant molecules into the system so that a strong interface could be built. I will show you some of our activities on interface, um, I mean, building action of compatibilizers. Compatibilizers are very similar to soap action of soap in oil water. Compatibilizing action is very similar to uh, the action of soap because compatibilizers have a hydrophilic functionality that will go to the that will go to the clay surface and the hydrophobic part that will go to the polymer part. So I can show you a couple of examples of compatibilizers, amino acid, alkylamines, polyethylamines, silane, they're all excellent surfactants to bridge the polymer and clay together. If you look at the next slide, you will see how they act. If you take tetra compound, what my student PhD student do is take clay and react the clay with tetra compound. So this is the first step we do. And when you do this, look at this. These surfactants go into the intercalaries and displace these sodium or potassium ion. They go and sit inside and increase the calorie spacing. So this is one of the first steps we do. Treat the clay with a good surfactant so that the intercalary spacing is increased. Once you do that, the macromolecules, the size of the macromolecular chain is 50 to 60 nanometers, they can definitely go into the, uh, into the uh, intercalaries of clay and you can get good dispersion. If you look at this slide, you can see this is the neat clay. Look at this, the neat clay. Close size, and the gallery spacing is very small. It could be uh, 0.5 or one nanometer. And but you, when you do a 
uh, intercalation pulses with the blue surfactant, you see that the peak is shifted to lower anchors. These are all different types of surfactant molecules we have used. So one of the first steps we do is feed the clay with a suitable surfactants. And once you do that, you can see the peak is progressively shifted to lower angle. That means you increase the displacement. Once you achieve that, you can get very good interaction between polymer and clay. So this is a very challenging part. So chemistry plays a very big role in making excellent polymer nanocomposite. Unless you do a good chemistry, you cannot achieve manufacturing good polymer nanocomposites. You can see these are a variety of surfactants being used by different research groups. These are all exciting surfactants with increasing molecular weight. As you increase the molecular weight, the, the activity is quite high. I can show you one of our um, recent work. From the back, we have done some nice work under the Indo French program. A student of mine came from uh, I mean, France. We have a joint PhD program. And she came with lots of nice clay. So what we did is we did two types of reactions. One is we directly, we directly went for oxidative polymerization and lean. So this is clay. We went for oxidative polymerization and lean without any chemistry. Look at what we got. We got intercalated polymer nanocomposites. And we took another role. We did a diazonium treatment on the clay, diazonium cation. When you do a diazonium treatment on the clay, you can see the diazonium, diethyl and diazonium ion go into the intergalleries and you have increased gallery spacing. And then what we did, we went for oxidative polymerization and look at what we got. We got a completely exfoliated nanocomposite. And the conductivity of this was five times higher than this. And modulus was 10 times higher than this. So we could get really exciting material when we do a little bit of chemistry on the clay surface. I will show you another important slide. We are very active in building uh, automotive tires, inner liners, inner tubes for many co tire companies in India, Marav tires, upward tires. So what we have done is, you know, this tire is made of different types of rubbish. If you look at the inner liner, inner tube of an automotive tire, people always go for uh, a synthetic rubber called uh, uh, chlorobutyne. So what my research group did is, why can't we do with natural rubber? Because India produces lots of natural rubber. But the issue with the natural rubber is when you make an inner tube, an inner liner with natural rubber, the air escapes quite rapidly. So you have to pump in air probably every week when you make a tube out of natural rubber. Or when you make an inner liner with the natural rubber for a tubeless tire. So what we have done is, look at the diffusion of air to natural rubber very high. So what we have done is, we introduced bentonites or a fluorohectolite, this 5%. Look at this. Natural rubber become almost impermeable to uh, air when you put 5% of fluorohectolite. Fluorohectolite is the best material. So we made impermeable automotive inner tubes and inner liners with the natural rubber. And you see how we organize the clay platelets. This is a natural rubber matrix, and clay platelets are being beautifully organized in the rubbery matrix. Let me show you some of our work on carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube is a very interesting material. Our interest was to make conductive elastic bands. You can see this slide. This is uh, natural rubber with one weight percent of carbon nanotube. But as you increase the concentration of carbon nanotube beyond 1%, you can see carbon nanotube forms a network inside the natural rubber. And interestingly, what you get is, look at this slide. This is, we have done some work uh, a few years ago with a French group. This is neat, neat natural rubber without any carbon nanotube. What is spotted is dynamic uh, modulus as a function of strain. As you stretch it, what happens? If you look at uh, neat natural rubber, you get a linear viscoelastic effect. Put one weight percent of carbon nanotube, again, you have a linear viscoelastic effect. But when you put more than 5% of carbon nanotube, look at a very strong, low linear viscoelastic effect. Why is it so? Because when you put more than 5% of carbon nanotube, carbon nanotube forms a network inside natural rubber. And once you stretch the rubber, 
you see the network is progressively reduced de uh, destroyed and as a result of this the stiffness of the material goes on decreasing interestingly what we did is we are a french company they were interested in making artificial skin so what we made is these are all very soft rubbers with natural rubber latest look at this we made conductive rubbers look at the volume resistivity decreases with increasing carbon nanotube so we made conductive flexible elastic bands by putting carbon nanotube into natural rubber let me show you another uh, very nice example of again at the street student of mine she worked on sbr rubber that's a very important synthetic rubber you can see this is structure of sbr rubber and we put carbon nanotube in the sbr rubber if you simply put carbon nanotube into sbr rubber and if you do a mechanical mixing you will see you will see lots of agglomeration you can see this carbon nanotube forms agglomerate structure in sbr rubber so what we have done is to avoid that we have made use of an ionic liquid you can see this is the ionic liquid we have used when you use an ionic liquid look at the dispersion of carbon nanotube in his br matrix a beautiful dispersion we have just shown one carbon nanotube here you could beautifully disperse carbon nanotube in his br matrix when you use ionic liquid and look at the percolation we got conductivity as a function of concentration of cnd you have a beautiful percolation process so using ionic liquid my research group could introduce carbon nanotube in sbr rubber and eventually what we have done we have made beautiful emi shields so there is series of patent on this we made emi shields soft elastomeric shielding materials by putting carbon nanotube into natural rubber it is into sbr rubber we could achieve something like 40 db shielding it was very interesting and the rubber is so flexible Let me show you some of our activity with the General Cable United States. They are the biggest cable company in the US. And our the mandate given by the company was you introduce different types of nanostructured materials into polymer. The polymer we have used was XLP cross linked with polyethylene that's a very interesting polymer. And the company provided us a variety of nanostructured materials. This is actually the TM picture of aluminium oxide, five percent of aluminium oxide in XLP matrix, cross-linked with polyethylene matrix. You can see lots of clusters are formed when you put five percent of aluminium oxide in that. This could not disperse well. Of course, the aluminium oxide was chemically modified. Still, there are lots of cluster formation. You can see cluster formation. And when you put clay. clay was also surface modified he could disperse clay beautifully in the in the polymer matrix polymer was xlp cross linked with polyethylene that's a very important polymer for cable manufacturing look at this slide what we have done is we have taken a combination of clay and aluminum oxide together 2.5% of clay 2.5% of aluminum oxide if you look at these two this is 5% of aluminum oxide 5% of clay look at the combination 2.5 2.5 combination one is to one combination we found that when you when you combine clay and aluminum oxide together you can suppress agglomeration process see look at they form some sort of structure formation my phd student made a beautiful cartoon look at this this is clay this is aluminum oxide when you have a one is to one combination these fillets form a network inside the polymer matrix this, this is xlp chains and effectively what is happening is the polymer matrix is immobilized by the network of filler so both clay and aluminum oxide they interact by electrostatic interaction and forming a network inside the polymer matrix look at the mechanics of this material this is neat polymer without any filler and when you put when you put 5% of clay you are somewhere over here when you put 5% of aluminum oxide you are here but you when you mix clay and aluminum oxide together 2.5 2.5 combination look at this there is a quantum jump in uh, uh, in properties 
Look at the modulus of this hybrid structure, 812 megapascal. If you put just clay alone, 370. If you put aluminum oxide alone, 384. So you get synergistic effect by putting two nanostructured fillers together. Interestingly, the company was very much interested because they had, they really wanted underwater cables, their diffusion of water taking place. And I wanted to show you a couple of slides. When you look at the diffusion, of, uh, I mean, diffusion phenomenon, if you use uh, XLP alone, there's a diffusion process. And when you have a combination of two fillers, for example, when you have aluminum oxide and clay together, look at this, the diffusion profile is very much restricted. If you just put one type of filler, clay or aluminum oxide, you are somewhere over here. And we also made a nice cartoon here. Look at this is XLP matrix with uh, clay. Uh, diffusion gets to take place. This is with, uh, with the clay alone. Look at, there is restricted diffusion. But when you have a combination of clay and aluminum oxide, the diffusion is very much restricted. Because clay and aluminum oxide form a network. And this network actually suppresses the diffusion pathway. So we made really impermeable cable for the DR cables company in the United States. Now let me show you some of our work on Department of Space in India. I cooperate with the Department of Space in India and the mandate they gave us to make super tough material, epoxies. My group is very active in epoxies. If you look at epoxy materials, a wonderful material, good thermal resistance, good modulus, good high temperature property. But epoxy, epoxy is a problem. They're not tough. They're extremely brittle. Why? Because the highly costly system. Look at the neat epoxy. You can see the fracture surface. Uh, you, you can see large number of fracture parts going across the material. The fracture resistance is very poor. There are different ways you can you can work on this. One one way is you add rubber. You have fabrication process. You can increase the fracture toughness, but you have to sacrifice the high temperature properties. You can add thermoplastic. You can improve the fracture toughness. But what we have done is, we have mixed epoxy resin with block of polymers. The beauty of block of polymers is they can self-assemble self into different types of superstructures. If you mix epoxy resin and block of polymers, you can make coarser structures, nanostructured coarser structures. We can make nano spherical missile. You can make uh, nano worm-like missiles. We can make nano vesicles. So that's the beauty of this. So how do you do this? You control the block of block of polymer ratio. You control the multiple weights. If you do that, you can make fascinating structures. You can make vesicles. You can make worms. You can make spherical missile. You can make coarser structures. So I can show you some of the work we have done. We have mixed epoxies with polystyrene block polyvitanide. It's a typical dibloc copolymer uh, obtained from shell. And what we have done is we have epoxidized the double bond of polyvitanide. When you do that, you see the type of nanostructures we have made. These are matrix of epoxy, and you see lots and lots of doors. These doors are self assembled polyvitanide and polystyrene. And if you look at the next uh, slide, you will understand the beauty of this nanostructuring. Look at this is the continuous epoxy matrix. And you have spherical particles of polystyrene, which is the core, the range of 10 nanometer size. And then you have epoxidized, these are the epoxidized polyvitanide, which loves epoxy resin. So we could make beautiful nanostructured material where the core is nothing but the polystyrene block. And the shell is, the shaded chains are epoxidized polyvitanide. So we could make beautiful nanostructure giving rise to very high improvement impact. We extended this work to many systems. Another PhD student of mine mixed epoxy resin with a styrene, isoprene styrene. There also we made beautiful structures. We made vesicles, we made spherical missile, and giving, giving rise to, you see some of the structures we have made, this is actually uh, worm-like structures. So we made beautiful high impact 
approximate materials by putting SAS, styrene, isoprene styrene triblock, SBS, styrene glutadiene styrene triblock. So this is one way of making beautiful super tough materials. Now I will go to some of the work we have done on sensors. We made beautiful sensors using, using rubber, flexible rubber. And the sensor technology is very simple. What we have done is we have mixed different types of rubbish, including natural rubber or isobutylic, isoprene rubber, by putting different types of nanofilates like expanded graphite or reduced graphene oxide or carbon nanotube. Most of the time, we made use of a solution mixing protocol. This is our uh, uh, experimental strategy for looking at the uh, uh, conductivity of this material. The next slide you will see what we have done. Look at a piece of rubber, very flexible rubber. We filled it with the graphene platelets. This rubber is so flexible, just tap on the rubber. When you just tap on the rubber, you make a network. You release a tapping force a few newtons. When you release a tapping force, you destroy the network. So effectively what we made is, we are able to make conductive rubbers. When you tap on the rubber, you make a network of rubbers. When you release the tapping force, the network is destroyed. So we are able to make pressure sensors. We could make beautiful pressure sensors by putting uh, nanoparticles. It could be CNT, or it could be graphene, or it could be a graphene oxide, or it could be expanded graphite. So we could make beautiful pressure sensors uh, using flexible natural synthetic rubbers. Look at the sensing action. This is uh, uh, synthetic rubber and expanded graphite. You, you tap on the rubber, you release the tapping force, you tap on the rubber again, you release the tapping force. This is with reduced graphene oxide. So we could make quite a lot of different types of sensors uh, by putting nanostructured materials, conductive nanostructured materials in rubbers. Let me now show you some of our activity on thin films. We are a, we are a very strong indoor French program, and still we cooperate with many French universities. I will show you some uh, work we have done on this aspect. If you look at thin films, thin films have lots of applications in transistors, in solar cells, mobile phones, in coating. We are particularly interested in coating, in sensors, and uh, biomedical applications. Thin films play a very important role. So what we have done is. If you look at this slide, we have a substrate, a wafer substrate, and then we made thin films on the surface of the wafer, wafer substrate. And the thickness of this thin film is in the range of 100 nanometers. And uh, this is actually basically polystyrene. When you look at a 100 uh, nanometer thick polystyrene on a substrate, this is a wafer substrate, which is chemically modified. You can see different regimes here. The polymer chains, which are very close to substrate, I will call it as strongly absorbed chains because the substrate is chemically modified. The polymer chains are able to anchor into a substrate. Just above that, you have loosely absorbed chains. Look at these are the loosely absorbed chains. And the outer layer is sort of dangling chains. They are non absorbed chains. And we try to understand what happens when you do rinsing process. You just put all the stuff in a good solvent. This is what is interesting. My PhD student, uh, she has taken a series of solvents and then try to understand what happens to these layers when you rinse them. Rinse for, uh, I mean, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. If it is a very good solvent, you know what will happen and during rinsing? The solvent will take away the surface layers. The chains which are grafted to the substrate will remain there. So this is what is shown over here. After re rinsing, you take out, and what happens to the, I mean, to, 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 to the substrate. So we looked at the thickness after after rinsing process, and you can see the type of solvents we have used. We have used toluene for rinsing. We have used chloroform for rinsing. We have used THF for rinsing. We have used acetone for rinsing to understand what happens when you take different solvents uh, to the residual thickness. And these solvents have been taken based on the solubility parameter. If you look at toluene, the toluene has a matching solubility parameter with the polystyrene. It's a good solvent for polystyrene. Look at the relative energy difference, 0.65. Uh, 
If you look at acetone, acetone is a bad solvent for polystyrene. So we looked at what happens after rinsing. If you look at uh, rinsing in toluene, 5 seconds, 30 seconds, 3 minutes, 20 minutes, up to 2 hours. Toluene is a very good solvent for polystyrene. You can see toluene has eaten away almost all the layers. Could, could dissolve all the layers. And what you really see is the layers which are grafted. You know, if you look at acetone, acetone is the bad solvent for polystyrene. Look at, at short intervals, acetone rinsed system were perfect. Acetone could not dissolve this polymer chain, but at longer intervals, of course, acetone also could remove most of the And then what we did is we looked at we looked at the the diverti phenomena. Look at the, the films which were rinsed in toluene. If you look at five second rinsing, 30 second rinsing, three minutes rinsing, you find diverting starts at 20 minutes of rinsing process. The clear diverting process. Look at the film which are rinsed in THF. THF is a bad solvent for polystyrene. And you can see the diverting starts after five seconds of rinsing. So we converted that. Diverting process is strongly related to the polymer solvent reaction. Even the bad solvents, the diverting phenomena starts at the very beginning. And this is very important for a large number of applications when you use polymers for uh, nanocomposites for coating applications. Now towards the last phase of my uh, presentation, we are also quite active in, uh, in the area of biomedical polymers. Biomedical polymers. So we do a lot of electro spinning in my laboratory. This is our electro spinning setup in the laboratory. We work, we, we, uh, we make use of a variety of biocompatible polymers like PLA, PLLA, different types of biocompatible copolymers. And then we put nanoparticles into the system and we make non oven mats. Basically for what? For wound healing applications. So this is the internal structure of these non-woven mud. You can see beautiful, fine uh, nano wires. And look at an wound, a, a sacrificial made wound. And this wound is closed by this tape. You see, after a week or two, the wound is completely closed without any, 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 any mark, any scar on the body. And how we made? We made by electro spinning by putting a little bit of nanoparticles. And because of this peculiar action of these nanoparticles, you have efficient cell, cell migration, cell proliferation, and angiogenesis. Therefore, you have excellent healing activity. I can show you, we, have, uh, we also work with the guinea pigs, animal model, to see the uh, healing uh, activity you can see this is the uh, this is the uh, wound we have made on the guinea pig and this wound is closed by this tape and then we looked at the healing activity look at the, this is our electrospan system electrospan uh, non moment mat we also made use of uh, nanoparticles look at these are the nanoparticles we have used before electro spinning, we mix the polymer solution with nanoparticles. It could be zinc oxide, it could be TiO2. We have used different types of nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles are very useful for own healing activity. But you have to select the right one and the right size and right shape. And these nanoparticles, look at this. This is actually uh, PCL with nanoparticles. Zinc uh, oxide. In the range of 60 nanometers of zinc oxide we have incorporated. When you put a little bit of zinc oxide, what happens is zinc oxide will react with oxygen and eventually you get hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide actually favors wound healing activity. That is the beauty of putting a little bit of zinc oxide. We just add only just 0.5% of zinc oxide into PCL. That gave a remarkable effect. Even 1% also gave very good effect. More than 1%, we found the deleterious effect in cell growth. A lot of cells died if you put more of zinc oxide. And when you do that, you have excellent cell proliferation, cell migration, and wound healing, and angiogenesis. That is the beauty of the total 
our own healing efforts. We also looked at the uh, disappearance of scaffold. You know, after a while, the scaffold has to disappear. Scaff scaffold is just temporary support. Look at this is PCL scaffold. We looked at the PCL scaffold after implantation, fifth day, tenth day, twentieth day. We also looked at PCL with the one percent of zinc oxide. We found that PCL with the one percent of zinc oxide, the disintegration was much faster. So nano uh, nanoparticles have a dual functionality. One is nanoparticles aids wound healing activity. Second point is nanoparticles aids faster degradation of the scaffolding because scaffold has to disappear after a couple of weeks, couple of months. Therefore, this is very beneficial. Incorporation of small amount of nanoparticles is very much beneficial for wound healing activity. We also quantified the wound healing process. Look at this is the work with the guinea pigs. This is the knee PCL. Uh, we have looked at day one. We, we went up to uh, we went up to day 30. Look at this is PCL alone without any nanoparticle. You, you see a scar here. But if you put 1% of zinc oxide, look at you don't see any scar here. So this is a positive glow, a positive control, there's negative control. So 1% of zinc oxide made dramatic change. Especially the scar could be completely avoided. And look at the quantified wound healing process. If you look at this, the system with the 1% of zinc oxide gave the best result. And this is neat PCL without zinc oxide. Wound healing activity is more efficient when you have 1% of zinc oxide. We are also quite active extracting nano from biological resources. And I, we also cooperate with Alain Dufresne in Grenoble. Look at some of the nice uh, electron microscopy pictures, PEM pictures. This is Tunisian cellulose extracted from Tunisian animal, which wheat straw, nanocellulose extracted from wheat straw. And this is uh, a cotton, nanocellulose extracted from cotton, and uh, nanocellulose extracted from crafshell, uh, nanochitin extracted from crafshell. This is actually nanostarch. So we are able to extract nanoparticles from a variety of biological waste. It could be agro waste, it could be waste from uh, fish industry, it could be, uh, I mean, uh, waste from, uh, uh, I mean, starch. So we are able to make nanoparticles from a variety of biological waste. I will show you a couple of slides we have done. My PhD student, now right now she is in the US, doing a postdoc. We have extracted nanoparticles from banana stock. We collected the banana from the plantation and went for an acid washing. Look at this beautiful nanostructures we have made from banana plant. And when you put this into polymerase, I have one more slide, it's a Swedish, uh, Swedish collaboration. Nano we made from uh, wood flower. They're all air from pictures. We could make beautiful nanostructures from wood flower. We had a four years of Swedish collaboration and uh, uh, with the Lulia University, a PhD student of mine, when Lulia, he made lots of nanostructures. And I will show you another important slide, our uh, Brazilian collaboration, pineapple leaf fiber. Nano from pineapple leaf fiber, if you see a picture of this. And with the Brazilian cooperation, we have one more, uh, we have one more interesting data. Brazilian collaborator was very active in making polyurethane for hot wire. And what we have done is, we have introduced uh, nanocellulose up to 10% into polyurethane rubber. And when you put 5% of nanocellulose into polyurethane, look at the strength of this material. 17.5 is a neat strength of PU, became 52.6. And if you look at the E modulus of this material, 37.5 is the E modulus of neat PU. If you put 5% of nanocellulose from uh, banana, uh, from pineapple, 9, 92.4. So there is a quantum jump in increase in modulus. So with the help of the Brazilian group, we have made Nanocellulose, polyurethane, prostate heart one. So it's a big cooperation of the Brazilian hospital. And uh, eventually we publish a series of papers and we have a few patents on this. So this is an exciting material to make uh, nanocellulose, uh, prostate uh, heart wall manufacturing. This is my last slide.
by putting nanoparticles into polymers, we can make a large number of functional materials. Mater new materials for wider applications. We are also cooperation with the plant company, a company in the US. We made uh, impermeable tables. We made automotive inner liners, inner tubes with the natural rubber. You can increase the mechanical strength to a very high extent you can by putting nanoparticles. You can get EMI shielding activity, particularly by putting nanoparticles into soft telastomates. We made excellent EMI shielders. We made conductive elastomeric bands for uh, artificial skin of the French company. We also made, due to the lack of time, we also made water purification membranes uh, by spraying nanocellulose on the surface of typical uh, water filters. We made sensors. We are able to make biomedical patches for our own healing applications. And I would like to thank my PhD student, Deepa and Kishore. They are now in Qatar. Uh, Martin became an associate professor now. Unima also became an associate professor. Uh, Vaishag is in Russia, the assistant professor in Russia. Kulud, she was my Indo French student right now in Qatar. Uh, Rani also an as, uh, associate professor now. I'm particularly thankful to Professor Siena Rao for the generous funding from the Nano Mission of India. And thankful to all the funding agencies, RO, CSAR, DBT, AICT, UGC, DRDO, DIT. And I have active cooperation with the uh, Terrell Academy of Sciences and BRNS, the Atomic Energy, and funding from General Cables United States, Czech Surface Street Company, where we did lots of surface modification of fillers, Apollo tires, the amount of tires. And I, I thankfully acknowledge the support of Didier Roussel from the University of Lorraine, France, Yves Grohens from South Virginia, and you will get Biontech from. Institute of Polymer Research in Dresden. And this is my group, the chemistry group. I have two groups. This is my chemistry group. I have an active group in chemistry, School of Chemical Sciences. You can see my collaborator from France, Yves Lokenstein. We got a photograph together with him. And this is my group in nano. We have a really big group in nanoscience and nanotechnology in MGU. You are very welcome to my campus. And this is my university, Mahatma Gandhi University. We are very active in polymer science, organic chemistry, you know, organic chemistry, physical chemistry. So I am quite uh, active in all these groups. And we have a, a center for nanoscience and we recently started uh, a school of energy materials. So this is the, uh, the front gate of the university. And very welcome to Kerala. Kerala is a very beautiful part of India. If you look at COVID, Kerala is one of the best state in India we could really uh, you know, control COVID very effectively, and this was appreciated by all over the world. And this is some nice pictures of Kerala, the Mohini Atom of young girls, very old temples, the, uh, the, the, uh, the traveling the canal of water, the beautiful, like in Venice, the boat race, Katagali, backwaters. This is some of the fascinating pictures of, uh, uh, I mean, Kerala. Maybe someday we can organize a STEM meeting in Kota, in my university. Yes. Sure, sir. We're organizing a meeting, International Conference of 100 Years of Macromolecular Science. Probably you all know that the concept of macromolecular science was introduced in 1920 by a German professor, Hermann Storinger. He is the father of macromolecular science. And we are celebrating now 100 years of macromolecular science. So we are organizing a webinar, 100 years of macromolecular science, uh, December 11, 12, and 13. So all are welcome for this meeting. And I also want to popularize my journal, Nano Structures and Nano Objects. It was part of this conference. So I request all of you to submit your uh, good articles, journals. Now the size score has become 5.6. And I wanted to build up an impact close to 10. That is my ambition. So please submit your good quality papers into Nano Structures and Nano Objects. It's a conventional journal, no page articles. So thank you so much for your patient hearing. And I wish all the best for the conference. Thank you.